That sounds worryingly similar to people in 12 step programs, but it's probably worth making um, the point that like people who are in some sort of addictive situation, um, autism in my case is simply part of who I am and what I am. And it's not something that can readily be um, given up or trained out of me. Um, and anybody that interacts with me, both co-workers, partner, and so on, um, will simply have to realize that they need to learn to live with it with me. Um, so that's a really important thing, I think, to, to realize right at the start. <coughs> um, so back to uh, the topic at hand, um, you gave me a theme of Neurodiversity 101 and uh, so the question right at the start, not everybody may know what neurodiversity means, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, and not everybody may know what 101 means. So uh, let me start with the 101 first. Uh, in, in American uh, lingo, so 101 is a lot of college uh, introductory courses to, to particular subjects for newbies who may not know very much to begin with. Um, so, uh, but let's come back to, uh, or let's go into that in a bit more detail, which brings us to George Orwell and the BBC. So that uh, refers to a second meaning perhaps more familiar to British audiences of um, 101 because in his most famous work Eric Blair or George Orwell as he called himself um, refers to uh, in 1984 to a torture room in the basement of the Ministry of Truth which was known as room 101. Um, this by the way is a picture of the uh, building where George Orwell worked uh, in 1942 to 45 and was apparently very unhappy and uh, proceeded to take the British Broadcasting Corporation as his inspiration for the rather sinister um, system, political system, and in particular the Ministry of Truth. Uh, for anybody who has read the book or and those who haven't, um, the, the, the hero, the protagonist is Winston and he is trying to uh, keep a little rebellion, internal rebellion going against uh, the 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 state, and he has a lover, Julia, and unfortunately, uh, the state, the system, gets becomes aware of that, tracks him down, and subjects him to torture in room 101. O'Brien is the functionary that tortures him, and he does end up rather unhappily betraying both his faith and Julia, because he is tortured by being confronted with his worst fear. So, um, in a sense, 1984 was his way of getting back at the BBC, but the, the BBC outlived him, and they got back at him. And how did they get back at him? They turned Room 101 into an extremely successful broadcast programme in which um, celebrities get interviewed um, about their, well, maybe not worst fears, but certainly pet peeves uh, in a very humorous fashion, uh, thereby revealing a lot of interesting autobiographical detail. So bringing us back to neurodiversity, what's that got to do with any of this? Well, my pet peeve, what the subject I'd like to banish to be locked up in room 101 is the linguistic ambiguity and uncertainty surrounding the 
phrase neuro, the word neurodiversity. And also perhaps it's worth mentioning, according to his latest biographer, Orwell was almost certainly autistic. So what's neurodiversity? Well, what's this? Exactly, biodiversity. So what's biodiversity? It's the spectrum of all living things on Earth. So what's biodiversity? Well, it's a phrase coined by Judy Singer, an Australian sociologist who um, came up in 1992 with this concept um, in the course of her um, dissertation on uh, autistic minds and how they work. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into the theory of mind to any great extent. Um, she was later interviewed by Harvey Bloom for the Atlantic magazine, and the points they, they both make really are worth considering um, that neurodiversity is, is a good term to describe the spectrum, infamous term, the spectrum of all possible manifestations of the human mind. Now, the vast majority of those are broadly similar. <clears throat> and by that, I mean the numerical majority tends to think in similar ways and emote in similar ways. And that is clearly what we largely perceive to be the standard. Uh, but not everybody conforms to the standard. So what, what is normal? Well, uh, you could say what's normal is what's usual or typical. So the current accepted term for this is the neurotypical mind. And then you clearly have a minority, the outliers on the bell-shaped curve, who diverge from this. And so they are not typical, non-typical, or neurodivergent. Uh, unfortunately, even a number of experts in the field continue to use uh, neurodiversity when they really mean neurodivergence. And that uh, introduces a lot of ambiguity, uncertainty, and confusion. And this is my, my pet peeve. I don't want to go on about it. But to uh, basically try and um, give you an idea of how large the outlier population is <coughs> and who comes under the umbrella of neurodivergence, is that latest figures uh, suggest about one in seven in the general population, um, mainly uh, predominantly in, in uh, functional issues, so dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, um, and to a lesser percentage, uh, the, the ones probably best known, which is autism on the one hand, and attention deficit disorders on the other. So autism was the one that was recognized first. Uh, it was publicized by two incidentally uh, Austrian at the time um, psychiatrists, Hans Asperger, who stayed in Germany and Austria, and Leo Kanner, who was Austro-Hungarian and emigrated to the United States and made his life and career there. They published around the same time, and they described uh, case re cases in, in considerable detail of their patients who ex exhibited what they described in the then uh, predominant lingo as psychopathology, um, but in a, in a very 
um, prototypical manner. So here's a brief summary, and I'm not going to go through it in detail of um, the, the significant time points in uh, autism studies. <coughs> and uh, it's probably worth just mentioning that the last one, um, the Neural Tribes book published by Steve Silberman, is for anybody who wants to read up on this uh, in a non scientific in a popular science uh, manner is probably the best uh, go to book and it's gone into second edition already third edition is being prepared so that's really um, the the best single book for the interested reader so autism is defined in the two predominant uh, nomenclatures which is the world health organization's icd-11 and the American uh, Psychiatric Association's DSM-5 um, in these terms. And this is what a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis of autism requires. But to come back to the term spectrum, uh, there's this infamous popular um, quip that, oh, everybody is on the spectrum somewhere. Um, I don't think it's particularly helpful. It's an attempt to um, express the fact that there is a huge amount of variability, um, both in terms of actual um, functional impairment and clearly um, autism uh, as a academic specialty in psychiatry and psychology started out recognizing the the most affected the most disabled and society and healthcare continue to struggle to look after the the most affected the most disabled people and as we learn more about the subject as we become more um uh, able to distinguish fine gradations the more we realize that actually um the while the number of severely affected, uh, severely functionally impaired people is significant but small, the number of people who have autistic traits um, and ultimately an autistic mind or an ADHD mind or otherwise neurodivergent mind, including Tourette's and other syndromes, um, is probably huge. So the other question is, if you do want to use the term spectrum, are you referring to a linear spectrum? Or is it perhaps not linear? And I'll come back to this a little later. So this uh, is the, the counter uh, piece for um, the uh, attention deficit disorders. Um, Again, I'm not going to go through it in detail, <coughs> but just to give you an idea of the distinction, the, the gulf really, between what the popular conception of ADHD is and the what it feels like inside the ADHD mind, or ADD if there, there's no hyperactivity. Um, this is really... Uh, something that I want you to to read in in a little bit of detail at least. Um, same as the artist like me is not necessarily very conforming to the stereotypical uh, conception. Um, the attention deficit uh, disorder affected person, and there isn't a handy term like autism, autist, there is not really an add -er or adhd -er. Um So linguistically, we're still struggling to make sense of this. And in any case, the, the, the whole disorder bit is something we really um, are not <laughs> very happy with. Um, and not least the fact that there is a huge overlap 
between the conditions. So uh, up to 45% uh, overlap, in fact, between the two um, marquee conditions, if you want to call them that. Uh, and this is something that even psychiatry and psychology have not fully caught up with because there's a lot of maybe older practitioners out there who will maintain to the last that they are uh, the diametric opposite of each other and you cannot possibly have both. I think I have both. Um, I have a lot of um, ADHD uh, traits. I don't have an official diagnosis, but that's really because I've never gone for one. Um, I might not fulfill the necessary criteria, but personally, among the large number of neurodivergent people and colleagues that I know, uh, a huge number of them are convinced that they have both. So to come back to whether spectrum is actually appropriate and useful, a term and a concept for it, um, I think something like this might actually be slightly more fit for purpose. Um, but I leave that to you to uh, digest. So uh, let's get back then to the neurotypical person. Now, I noticed that there's um, not quite 100 people participating in this. Um, and as I said, one in seven in the general population is thought to have some non-neurotypical traits at the very least. And medicine actually uh, is well recognized for selecting medical school admission, for selecting for um, well autistic traits such as uh, academic strengths in particular. So I'm just going to put it on the table that um, out of the audience, probably 13 or 14, if not more of you, um, may very well be non-neurotypical. So this is a brief description, again, <laughs> population statistics of the classic or average neurotypical life experience. And this right out of the box for an autistic person is pretty much a description of our worst nightmare. We just could not hack this at all. Um, so, yeah, just think about it. So neurodivergent people have been humorously hitting back, in a sense, at the academic uh, attempts to put them into the psychopathology box. And this is one way of doing it. Um, so this is a, a humorous description of neurotypicality from a non-neurotypical point of view, putting it under the microscope exactly the other way around. And I think this is worth digesting for everyone. Um, just to create a little bit of a counterbalance. So the classic um, neurodivergent uh, dysfunctions so include, as I've said, dyspraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, hypersensitivity to noises and other stimuli, lights, flashing lights, bright lights, whatever. They can be surprisingly and and and, and disablingly uh, disruptive for us. Um, but this is one, this dysfunction is one that is only very recently um, receiving attention. And this is a um, difficulty with being with awareness of um, body perception, enteric internal body perception and mind perception. 
So for example, I am notoriously incapable of telling when I'm hungry and become hypoglycemic. Um, my wife asked me when to make dinner ready for, and I grab a number out of thin air because I honestly couldn't tell her. So I get hangry, as they say quite a lot. Alexithymia is a term to describe the inability to tell when you're depressed or manic or whatever. And this is also something that a lot of us uh, struggle with, suffer from. But to come back to the need to fit into a largely neurotypical world, um, those of us who have made it into medical school and uh, further um, have will only have succeeded and will only have survived because they were able to mask. And masking is extremely tiring. It's like a toll, like a tax we pay on top of everything else in life. And this is why we're very prone to decompensation, which basically means meltdown in the acute phase or burnout uh, in, over the longer term. Um, so this is something you really need to take account of. This is something that managers, line managers, service managers need to take account of. Uh, so this is a brief excerpt from one of our WhatsApp threads, the one that I'm moderating. Um, which just gives you a flavor. Um, yeah, so masking is so much more uh, exhausting than anesthetic work. Um, the other thing and I want to say, you know, if my face to you appears somewhat severe, uh, I'm not smiling a lot, I'm not uh, basically showing much um, emotional display on my face at all. This is why. So especially in autism, not so much maybe in ADHD. Um, there is <laughs> one, one, <laughs> um, resting bitch face problem. And uh, this connects with the double empathy phenomenon. So um, resting bitch face, please don't take offense. And it's not me meant in a gendered way. Um, affects us all um, and we often unfortunately get um, blowback from neurotypical people because they think we are dissing them or being rude or whatever and honestly we're not. Um, the double empathy problem is really really important because um, neurodivergent people are being spoken about as being um, communication impaired. And from a neurotypical point of view, certainly we are, but it actually isn't true amongst uh, neurodivergent people. We communicate really quite well. So bear that in mind, please. So um, lastly, um, well, not lastly, I have a lot more, could go on forever. Um, there are strengths, there are definite um, autistic strengths and ADHDers strengths. Um, so we very much would like to push back against this um, catastrophic narrative of um, disorders and, and impairments um, because we do have a lot of good stuff to bring to the table and medicine would be losing the benefit of that if and when and as we get weeded out or fouled by the wayside with burnout. So um, yeah, just um, putting that on the table. So in terms of an emerging self-confidence really, and ability to stand up for ourselves. We are 
way behind other movements. But we are beginning to speak out for themselves, for ourselves, advocate. And this is exactly what I'm doing here today. Um, worthwhile mentioning in this context, intersectionality. So going back to the previous slide, um, we know that there is bias and discrimination still existing against um, females, ethnic minorities, um, and so on and so forth. Now, if you fall into any of those, obese perhaps, whatever, and you're neurodivergent as well, these, these add up. And that is something that absolutely in the context of diversity um, improvements needs to be taken into account. So um, I just wanted to highlight these two people. They may be familiar to you, Chris Day and Arua Manjuda. Um, they have been on the receiving end of rather dodgy treatment by the regulatory authorities uh, in her case and the um, everybody except the regulatory authorities in his case. Um, there are really two ongoing scandals that have brought um, the regulatory system into a serious uh, disrepute. And you may be familiar with the current discussion whether GMC is fit for purpose. I have been at the receiving end of a two year GMC investigation um, for fitness to practice and have been practicing under restrictions, which were lifted when it was realized that there was no case to answer. And this is a very, very common uh, experience for neurodivergent people. So I'm, I've exceeded my 30 minutes. If you allow me to go on for another five, I have more material, but that's... Cool. Um, yeah, keep, no problem, keep going, Kyle. Right, so um, just a brief uh, note on um, ADI. ADI was founded as recently as April 2019 by um, an Irish consultant anaesthetist and it's worth noting that while I didn't make it to consultant, um, quite a lot of our members have. So it's not that if you're autistic, you can't possibly become a consultant. You just need to be extra tough and have a bit of good luck. Um, so this is the um, uh, icon that one of our members designed, the uh, canary bearing a stethoscope. And the reason for that is that the canary in the coal mine, you will re recall, was a, a, a famous uh, low tech um, warning um, uh, device in, in coal mines, because when the canary keeled over and died due to uh, gas in the coal mine, that's when the miners had to um, get out of there. Um, and the reason we've picked this, is that one of the autistic traits is, and it's very, very strong, is for fairness and truth. And that, unfortunately for us, makes us very prone to become whistleblowers, and we generally get stabbed in the back by the system, the corporation. Um, and that's exactly what happened to me. That's exactly what happened to a lot of our members. Um, so interestingly, um, in, if you think of the GMC duties of a doctor, um, truth telling, um, transparency, uh, whistleblowing is actually what the GMC promotes. And who is best, who is most reliably does this? Well, autists. Because we don't know how to not stick our head above the parapet. So ADI has grown rapidly, um, now over 800 members, uh, and has gone from being a peer support group, which it still is, to actually become very prominent with uh, audit research and advocacy. 
Um, this is a uh, excerpt from a paper currently in pre publication. Has already been presented as a poster. Um, and I've just highlighted some significant findings in uh, reddish there. Um, as I said, I speak as an artist. Um, this is a recently published paper in the uh, hospital, British Hospital Journal of Hospital Medicine uh, from us, which uh, is a really good go to if and when you um, want some more detail on um, how to accommodate um, autistic, not only patients, but colleagues as well. Um, so that's really your first of call, I would say. There's also a BJA education uh, paper in preparation, currently in advanced review stage um, on a similar theme. So keep an eye out for that. Um, as I said, I'm primarily an autist and ADI is my primary support grouping, but um, other uh, Groupings are available for other flavors of neurodivergence. Um, and these, as you will know, as you will see, have, have many hundreds of members, and that's primarily in Britain, even if they, like us, um, are intentionally um, open to international members. So finishing really with some paradoxes that are worth contemplating. Um, and finally, so you, um, these are some people you may have heard of at some point, um, and they are mostly autistic. Um, Brendan Fraser is actually not diagnosed as anything, but admits uh, that his son has ADHD. Um, John Nash was the subject of the movie A Beautiful Mind, and um, there are there's half a dozen Nobel Prize winners in this uh, slide alone. Um, for the ones perhaps slightly more recent, um, you may be familiar with these. Um, the more ancient ones in the right top corner, left bottom corner are Beethoven and Mozart. The one in the middle is Isaac Newton. Um, yeah, well. The world would be a very different place without neurodivergent people. And lastly, I promise this is, this is arguably autist number one um, in the description of the case series of 11 by Leo Kanna, and uh, he died last week. So rest in peace. And yeah, I'm open to questions. Thank you.